last time we discussed the Winchester 1892 carbine in the Great War. Well, that would not be the only lever action to enter the fray. And no, we still don't mean the 1895. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is actually a different lever action than last time. This is the Winchester 1894. Let's go look in the light box. 38 inches in length and still weighing in at just about 6.8 pounds, this is also, like our 92 before, a very handy rifle. It chambers the 30 caliber Winchester centerfire cartridge feeding six from a tubular magazine. Last time we covered the uh, history and development of the Winchester 1892 and its role in the war. That was a pistol caliber carbine. This, is mostly a rifle caliber carbine. And so before we get to this, you should probably watch the previous episode. And if you can't do that, well, let's just go over a quick recap. Winchester had pushed the toggle lock lever gun to its limit with the Model 1876. Marlin had beat them out with their Model 1881, which could handle 4570. With John Browning's help, Winchester would then release the powerful 1886, which told Marlin that they needed to diversify to stay in the market, so they released the Model 1889 to target the dated Winchester 73. In response, Winchester would produce the Model 92, using Browning's action. Alright, you guys got it? Yeah, go watch the other episode. Anyway, uh, that leaves everybody in the market with a full-powered rifle and a pistol caliber carbine and various shades of those two versions, but there's this gap right down the middle of what do you do if you don't want 4570 and you don't want 4440 or something equivalent to either of those. And so that's room for innovation. And to fill that gap, well, Marlin would get to work. They would take up the bollard cartridges, 3240 and 3855, both popular for medium-sized North American game, and release their own compact but not pistol-chambered rifle. All right, Winchester's had just about enough at this point because they keep following the market instead of innovating. And I should probably put this down because we are nowhere near this guy yet. Well, we're a little near that guy. Uh, instead, we should be talking about this, the 1892 still, because this was their market dominator at that moment. This thing was insanely popular and it's adorable and it's the perfect shape. It's the perfect, light, handy, beautiful, to hold, narrow, wonderful, all the way around, loved and appreciated. This is it, this is the gun. The problem is, in order to make what would be an intermediate cartridge to them, not modern intermediate, but between pistol, and full bore rifle. In order to do that, they would have to increase the size on this. So it would have to be smaller than the 86, bigger than the 92. That's not ideal. And that would just be keeping pace with Marlin. It would not be innovating. And also, by the way, if they did that, they'd have to introduce whole new parts and blah, 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 blah. The whole production line. So what they needed was a way to go ahead and put a longer cased cartridge in this action, just as powerful locking up, and yet there's a hesitation there because if we open this up, you will see this is where our lever ends up on our stroke. This is how far back our breech block goes, and that's sort of it. If we want the breech block to go back further, we're going to have to open up the lever more. They don't want to open up the lever more because that makes it an uncomfortable stroke from the shoulder. You don't want to have to turn your hand all the way upside down because that's going to torque on your wrist and elbow. It's going to be an uncomfortable gun to use. So what they need is a way to go ahead and open that breech block up more distance wise without sacrificing any of that stroke that instead of having to open up the stroke even further. That's physically dimensionally impossible in this rifle. And as a matter of fact, in order to do that, you would have to be some sort of freaky weird genius magician monster man. All right, we get it, he's a genius. Yep, Johnny B would work up and patent a brilliant solution. Just let the bottom of the receiver all hang out. And with his innovation, the same stroke of the lever could move a much longer cartridge in the same space. Boom, compact receiver and long cartridge. That means Winchester now has a rifle that is 
well, the same size and weight almost as the 92, and yet she can stroke all the way open in order to accommodate, see that nice little action there? Look at all that. In order to accommodate things like eh, 3855 or 3240, these are good North American game cartridges, which is beautiful. Now, they knew they had a winner on their hands because they would rush to production with, again, William Mason's help, setting her up by October of 1894, making this, surprise, surprise, the Winchester 1894 a venerable American legend. Now, they also went so far as to make as many parts as possible, barrels, magazine tubes, uh, sights, fittings, internal components, extractors, things, everything they could possibly get to make it compatible with 1892 production. So that way they could just get it going, run, go, got it. And not only that, but save production in the long run. So beautiful system. In a general sense, there would be a Winchester 1894 rifle and a carbine, with the latter being much more popular. But that is a gross simplification of the number of customizable options applied to these guns in the commercial market. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. It's about a certain cartridge. And you see, it wasn't initially offered, not until 1895, in which they tweaked the receiver composition, the steel was changed just a bit in order to give it a lot more strength. And in that, they would introduce two new cartridges, 25 Winchester Centerfire and 30 Winchester Centerfire. Now, while all Americans are born with an intrinsic understanding of this cartridge, I better make sure I define it for everybody else. Later known as 3030 for its 30 grains of powder, the generic name was a consequence of competitors not wanting to use the word Winchester in their catalogs. This cartridge was developed to provide enough punch for most North American game. Just enough punch, making it milder on the shoulder and easier to pair with a small, light rifle or carbine. Designed and released with smokeless powder, it would be the first of its type for many Americans, which is probably a large part of why it was so heralded. There would be more chamberings for this gun over its lifespan, but... I'm not going to get into it today. There's a lot of commercial options for this gun. We are talking about some very specific patterns today. So uh, let's go ahead and take a closer look at what makes up a 94. So zooming in, there's our gun, but most importantly, here is an earlier 92. And the whole trick, remember, is to make this take a larger cartridge. So we want to do this and have it look almost the same. And I'm going to tell you, I think they nailed it. Uh, this is some highlights for kids. This is one of these things is not like the other. One of these things is 30-30. So let me just get this 92 out of the way because Winchester accomplished their mission perfectly. This is a beautiful, beautiful rifle. So um, mechanical differences, really. We've got one in the form of opening this lever arm and seeing, I'm sorry, try to keep it in frame, that the receiver is dropping out the bot. Man, who dropped my thing. The receiver falls away in order to give us a longer stroke on that breech block, which means a longer cartridge overall. Additionally, if you're curious, that locking lug is now all the way at the rear, which we'll see more of in the animation, but this is much stronger arrangement, beautiful system, again, genius. Uh, also, for those of you who are thinking of a war perspective, yes, this is a terrible way to introduce mud and dirt into the action, but this is a sporting rifle at this time. Now, once we're closed up, I want to show another feature. If I grip this gun, I can drop my hammer when I pull the trigger, like you would expect. But if I have her open just a bit, and let me get her lined up as tight as I can so I can really kind of prove this to you. There we go. I got nothing. And that's all controlled by a grip safety button right up under here. And then last, if you're wondering, this gun looks a little worse for wear. And compared to the 92 earlier, it's certainly a lot lighter in the receiver. And you might be tempted to say that the receivers on the Winchester 94s were in the white. It's very common to see them in the white 100 years later. But actually, they were blued the same as the 92s. It's just that that change to the uh, steel, especially the fact that there's a lot of nickel content in there, means that it rejects the bluing. And so, over years of just sort of general use, not even hard use, it all rubs off. I mean, it's very common to see these rubbed completely off, and it's very rare to see a deep blue 94 that hasn't gone through some sort of refurbishment. But anyway, uh, let's go ahead, because I cannot take this rifle down. There's no easy field stripping of this gun. It's all pins and screws. Let's go ahead and use our x-ray spectacles to get a look at the rest of the action. All right, let's load up the tube magazine. 
Again, this takes a moment. Like the Model 92, we're going to wash that main lever first. Here, it still rocks the bolt back and forth, opening and closing the action. And like the 92, it acts on the firing pin to guarantee reset. The big difference is that it also drops the floor of the receiver, which now extends out of the action so we can get a longer stroke with the same compact size. That receiver floor, or link, also draws down the single vertical locking block, unlocking the action. The 94 also has a grip safety, which simply blocks the trigger when the lever is open. Another safety can be found inside the locking block itself, a floating striker which can only transfer a blow from the hammer to the firing pin when the action is locked. The cartridge stop from the earlier 92 is also gone, replaced by a simple rib on the front of the link. I believe this rifle proves that John Moses Browning is the MC Escher of guns. At this point, I think we know that we have on our hands a darn good shooty stick. But what the heck does this commercial gun have to do with the Great War? Well, as you guys know from over the course of this series, just about anything will come out the window whenever war were declared. So the British adopted the 1892. Well, who picked up the 1894? Well, technically three people did, but primarily in this episode, and especially the one in my hand right now, you're not going to believe this, folks, but it was the French. That's right, desperate for arms, the French would acquire the Winchester 1894 carbines in 3030. Bought up, destined for couriers, artillery troops, railway personnel, and probably a balloon or two. And to make them just a bit more fit for duty, the French would make their own modifications. And like I said, this is just one of those rifles, so let's take a closer look at how you can tell if you found a French version of this gun. So, zooming in, we're going to see that these suckers are a 20 inch long barrel carbine format with a saddle ring. Although the French didn't really prefer it because they would fit their own slings. Here and here. And these appear to be French made, French inleted, and French attached. They also had what is known as a Model 44A rear sight, although instead of being sighted in yards, it's in meters. And I'll get you a little image to zoom in on that. As you can see, it ranges from 200 to 1000. And this particular one, on loan to us from our good friend Michael Carrick, who by the way I must thank for both of these episodes, thank you for loaning these guns, and thank you for providing a lot of the information that was used for this episode. He's done a ton of research on these Everybody clap for Michael. Anyway, uh, from his particular example here, we have a chance to see that it was double struck at some point. And I know that's not definitive proof, but to me that says that that might have been done on an armory level as well, and not necessarily by the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. Anyway, otherwise these are bog standard 94s, and so they don't really stand out all that much, and many have been sort of ruined by being sporterized or otherwise played with after the war. Alright, so these are pretty distinctive, and they're very neat, and I'm happy to tell you that 15,100 were ordered in September of 1914 from Winchester by Remington. You see, Remington seems to have been an exclusive supplier in North America to the French, and therefore everything seemed to go through them, and so Remington would buy from Winchester to get these to give to the French. Now, you would think that something like that would be very well known, but nobody seems to recognize these guns, at least not until very, very recently. It's probably been the past five to ten years that people have really started knowing what these are, and a lot of that has to do with our friend I mentioned before. So, what the heck happened to obscure these things' histories? Well, for starters, I don't know that Remington and Winchester want to broadcast that they're having to sell back and forth to each other to take care of these contracts. So, there probably wasn't an invested interest in marketing that this sale had happened. So, therefore, it's not really overstated at any point. And 15,100 is a lot, but it's not so many that it's like a significant portion of a military contract at that time, especially in the Great War. So, in that regard, it sort of just floats on by. And then something else would happen later to further obscure it, but we'll get that in a moment. Instead, let's go ahead and get this into May's hands finally, as you all have been waiting, and see how she shoots. Upon 
Alright, this is inarguably one of the best rifles ever made in history. I'm sorry. I like the 94, I like 3030, it's a beautiful sporting cartridge. We'll find out whether or not it's a good military rifle in a moment, but it's a joy to shoot. I love shooting these things. Now, uh, the French, however, did not think of it as a military rifle for sure, because they only issued it, like we said, to couriers and things like that. So, rear echelon only. And a lot of that also has to do with the fact that it's a proprietary cartridge. They don't have 30-30 and anything else in their entire army. So, it'd be ridiculous to try to move that ammo back and forth to the front line. So, why is this in our show? Just like I did with the 92 last time... Somebody bet their life on this gun, okay? Those guys carried on their backs, ran messages, things like that. They had their own ammo that they had to be responsible for. They weren't expected to fight, but they still banked on this gun. It wasn't just a training gun. And also, it's a fascinating story and a fascinating gun, and we're going to see it in two other places in just a moment. So, for the story alone, I went ahead and included this in the series. And, again, somebody banked their life on it. Not a lot of people, but somebody did. And it's a 94, like you guys are arguing. This is a beautiful piece of history. So why is it that we don't know about these guns? I mean, again, I teased a little bit before, and then I said that there's something else that happened. Well, these things would be sold post-war out of French inventory, almost all of them. All, we thought all of them for a while, but now we know a little bit better, and I'll get to that in a moment. Almost all of them went through a Belgian exporter and therefore had Belgian stampings on them, which confused everybody. These Liège proof marks were a real bother for a long time, so let's break them down. The ball blindy means jacketed bullet. The crown over R is for a rifle barrel. The star and F were for the inspector. And the flaming bomb with the L inset is for proof firing. Now, the big tip-off was that not all of the guns were marked that way. And this one certainly isn't marked that way either. Uh, it's just blank. But, thanks to a friend of the show, James Pazer, Pazer? I hope I'm getting it right. If I'm brutalizing your name, I'm sorry I'm terrible with everything. But, uh, thanks to our friend James, we have this one, which unfortunately befell Bubba. Um, she's been sanded, polished, and trimmed down on the barrel. This thing has a lot of work in it. Um, however, it has one very unique feature, and I'll pop a picture for you in just a second. And it's going to show you that it was actually marked and proofed by saint Etienne. Nice little cornerstone piece of proof of our French connection. The Belgian myth, however, was reinforced by, well, export-import. So the Belgian firm that proofmarked them then sold them into the Belgian Congo. Now, a lot of people say that these are Belgian cavalry carbines from World War I or for the Congo or for their cavalry nothing, guys. They were sold into the Congo on commercial sales. So likely there was some sort of mining or farming operation down there that had carbines. I don't know anything about Belgian-Congo relations that would lead to commercial enterprises needing a lot of rifles and ammunition in order to do what they do. I recommend Leopold's Ghost if you guys are confused about this topic. It is brutal. But uh, these guns, the ones that were Belgian-proofed anyway, would go to the Belgian Congo, and then with Congolese independence in the 19, you know, 1960, well... Those companies are out of business, essentially, so they sell off their inventory into the export market. So most of them actually sold over to Canada. So Canada got a whole bunch of these in, and they have Belgian proof marks, and they're told that they're coming from the Belgian Congo, and boom, that's where the story locks in. And so they become Belgian carbines, and it stays that way for a long number of years. But we know, thanks to our friend Michael Carrick, 
can't really be the case because he ran down the proof marks and apparently that particular style didn't even appear until the early 1920s. And so they can't have been World War I Belgian anything. And we already know that the contract was bought out and that the dates on the receivers and everything date back to World War I. So where were they uh, exactly? So proof is now on it. We now know that these are the French guns and it took that long to come around. Now, I should also say that the Winchester 94 served in other countries without these modifications. One of them would be right here in the US. They were bound to the Pacific Northwest. These were property of the US Army Signal Corps who were tasked with settling a labor dispute over critical war material. Spruce. You see, old growth American spruce was the best source of raw airplane material during the war. Light, strong, and long fibered, it resisted splintering from, oh, say, incoming bullets which made it in incredibly high demand. But the Pacific Northwest was still wild, with few roads or railways, so there were only so many lumber mills and logging teams, and they were in the middle of a pretty big dispute. The loggers were fed up with long hours, poor safety, and stagnant pay. They had formed a union which was looking to get recognition by the industry. The owners, of course, hated this notion and pushed back. They also weren't too worried about profits because any production could just be priced through the roof and still sell in this wartime economy. Well, that situation, of course, devolved into strikes, sabotage, I mean, just complete halting of production practically. And so uh, total output for like most of 1917 was maybe 3 million board feet of spruce. The demand in October alone from the war effort was 10 million board feet of spruce. This is not sustainable. They need these supplies. And so the government had to intervene. And so they would form the spruce production division of the US Signal Corps because they were responsible for producing airplanes. And so the US Signal Corps had to get in there and work out some of this mess. So the US Signal Corps would send in soldiers, but only some of them armed with rifles or carbines in this case. Instead, a lot of these guys were actually working the land. They would uh, go in with pickaxes and rail track and lay out rails to in order to create more uh, transport. They would actually start sawing and cutting down trees and producing lumber. Uh, this was all done to sort of bypass the stagnation in that market. And they would work closely with the local sawmills. But... It rubbed everybody the wrong way at first. Uh, the owners were worried that the government rolling in was going to lead to government control over the entire industry and it's going to destroy their profits and they were going to have to do things like pay people fair wages or something. I, the owner's side of this is a little hinky. The actual like unionist side, who by the way had been to their degree saboteurs and other things too, so nobody's completely right or wrong in this situation. But uh, from the unionist side, they saw the government itself as being a strike breaker, removing their ability to bargain in order to control production and therefore get what they want. But ultimately, as months passed on, both sides got to see that the U.S. Signal Corps very carefully navigated the middle and worked at a deal for everybody, stabilizing the market. In getting production going again, they would negotiate better hours for the workers, help establish a union, provide discounted labor to the businesses, expand their market and infrastructure wildly, and provide protection from the last of the troublemakers. Now, on that last one, they really couldn't waste perfectly good Springfield 1903s on guarding lumber. So the Signal Corps bought up 1,800 commercial Winchester 94s along with 50,000 rounds of ammo. These had no special features whatsoever and are nearly indistinguishable from a bog standard commercial carbine, except they were marked over the receiver. These guns were stored post-war and during World War II, some would be pulled back out and sent to Britain for home guard use. Which is fine, I suppose, because the British had already purchased some 5,000 or so during the Great War. Again, these were Dominion of Canada proofed commercial carbines. Chambering 3030, they were often marked with a large N for naval service. Just like the 92s, these were released from service post-war. So yeah, 1,800 U.S. carbines, 15,100 French, and 5,000 British. That puts a measly 21,900 or so in the war, all of them in secondary or rear-line roles. But as I said, who can resist this little darling? And so we talked about it today. Now, these guns again saw military service in the Great War, but I wanna say that they were also a rabid commercial success 
for Winchester with over 7 million sold. And they would be produced right up until 1964 when nothing happened at all and we don't want to talk about anything after that and besides it's beyond the scope of this war. Anyway, uh, I should mention again that these things were dusted off and put back into the Pacific Northwest, although actually I shouldn't say dusted off, new manufactured World War II era Winchester 94s were bought by the Canadian government in order to be put into the Pacific Northwest for another great war, this time with the Pacific Coast Militia Rangers. These guys were dispatched throughout the wilderness of the West in order to keep an eye out for any Japanese landings. And so they were given a choice over what they wanted, and they chose the Winchester. They were fitted with Enfield barrel bands, and I've got an article over on the site about these guys. Again, kind of beyond our scope today. That doesn't mean I don't have one though. Look at this thing. Actually, technically this is Susie. She would kill me if I lost this. Beautiful gun though. All right, so that's gonna wrap us up for today. Let me just find somewhere to... And maybe we'll shoot this some other time. So, beautiful gun, sporting purposes, repurposed for war, certainly rugged enough for some things, definitely not uh, easy in the mud. But let's go ahead and get it over to May and get her opinion on working with the Winchester 1894. All right, once again, we've made room for May, and, uh, you know, I shouldn't lie, we film these in a batch anyway. But, uh, we have a lever gun back in our hands, uh, this time slightly different than the other one, I mean slightly, because this really is basically the 92 all over again, so I'm not sure how much May's really going to offer us on this episode, but let's go ahead and put it in her hands and see how she... Is this what... We are a World War I show at the moment. That is not World War I issue. Sea Cowboy. Sea Cowboy. Don't be jelly. He's just jelly on a cowboy hat. You're Manatee Boy. Dope hat. Not as dope hat. All right, anyway, let me put this gun in your hands so we can get through this episode. So, uh, I guess there's not a lot to talk about in terms of differences, but let's go through the ergonomics. <laughs> yeah, okay, guys. So, we have had an episode where we've talked about the 92. Go back and watch that because it is relevant and there's going to be some comparisons here and there with it. So I feel like you might not get the full experience if you don't go check it out. So do that now. Anyway, getting into the 94. Uh, a lot of similarities between the two. I will say that it's sleek, narrow, light, good balance to it. Very, very much like similar to the 92, almost identical in some ways. Um, some differences, I would definitely say the action this guy not as smooth as the 92. There is like a point in which it does feel like it wants to catch before it wants to pop all the way open when it's pulling back the um, breech. Like it just, it doesn't feel quite as like, yeah, there's definitely a lope in there. You can even just see it right there, which makes the action a little bit more difficult when it comes to like quick maneuverability. Like that, that can be a problem. So keep an eye on that. Um, it'll still have the half cock. It's nice, but I also have now a grip safety right down here with the lever. So you have to be gripping the lever in order to actually be able to pop, pull the trigger. Um, so yeah, I've just got double safety, which, you know, neat, whatever. I mean, I feel like the half cock was enough, but it's cool. I can have two. There's no real problem with that. Um, yeah, I guess in terms of ergonomics, there, that's, that's pretty much it. There's really not that much of a difference. The comb is still the same height, still got the straight wrist so I can grip the uh, handle easily. Like, I don't know, I, I still like it in terms of ergonomics, like all the positive things are there. Yeah, um, at a glance, you're not going to get much of a difference between these two guns. And so all their ergonomics will, ergonomics will hold true, uh, except for maybe a little bit more weight there and just by a shade. Actually, yeah, and I think the butt, look at that, like it actually has a little more of a curve to it. That's true, although that little feature has more to do with uh, individual ordering, because you could probably get this more curved or less curved depending on whatever you specify. Okay. So um, even in that regard, that's just a coincidental difference between the two guns. And they even have like the same rear sight and things like that, although like we said, minor changes. So um, aside from the French adding those sling swivels, which we didn't use a sling, so I don't really know how you'd rate those. I mean, did they get in your way? No, not really. They they kind of just were there. I, you could hear them clinging like when I was shooting and stuff like that, but I they didn't really feel that awkward. Now, I guess like if someone had longer hands, I could see this kind of being awkward to wrap your thumb around. That's about it. Like for me, 
like my thumb stayed pretty low so i i honestly didn't have any issues with that one yeah and by the way that's the saddle ring that comes from the factory so it'd be a problem with either gun if it was a problem at all yeah so uh is there any big difference in shooting the two guns all right so well first off loading i mean i'm loading fewer bigger rounds so i yeah whatever that's cool a nice trade-off i've got you know bigger oomph with my shot cool um the sights you know both this one on the 92 they're they're 44 a sights and there shouldn't be a difference but i've noticed on the 94 these are actually a little bit deeper cut so they're actually a little bit better than the 92. i mean i don't know why there is a difference between the two when they're the same sight supposedly but there is and then what's this what's this metters on here Come on guys, they don't speak French. Put it in English, please. Um, and the actual firing part, pulling the trigger, same as the 92, it's smooth, short, crisp, and you don't know when that brake is hitting. It's, it's absolutely lovely. And the recoil, now I will say 3030, fantastic cartridge, love it. It does carry more oomph with this guy, certainly more than the 92 that had that pistol cartridge, but like coming out of this guy, it does feel there is more coming at you definitely but i don't think it's unmanageable it just for me was a little bit surprising on range to go from the 92 to the 94 and suddenly be like oh there it is it does fit the rifle more i will say that it did feel like a better fit um and then in terms of actual performance how i did i thought i was fairly accurate with it i mean i j certainly did better than with the 92 because i really feel like with the 94 i had to take it more seriously because there was just more oomph behind it. It didn't feel like I was just plinking around like with a 22 or something like that. So yeah, this this was a fun shooter on range. I'm not so sure how this would do in battle conditions. Yeah, we'll get more to the problems in a second, but the cartridge at least is a very strong performer and certainly would have been welcome in the Great War. And it might have even been better in some regards for the actual distances fought. It's not what we call modern intermediate cartridge, but it wasn't quite mm, as powerful as a lot of these full rifle cartridge, military cartridges that we're seeing at the time. A good compromise for the period. Although, yeah. again, rimmed, so other problems like we've seen in other episodes, yada, yada, yada. All that said, uh... I know you love 94. I know you're a sea cowboy. How would you feel about taking this into battle? Trenches or boat? Because apparently it did both. And then the third thing it did was guard spruce trees. I don't think we really need to ask your opinion about that. So on a boat, in a trench, how's it going to go for you? It sucks. That's what's going to go. Like, it's, it's just not going to do well. Because in the trenches, I still have the problems I originally had with the 92. And actually worse, because... Look, that receiver's got to drop all the way down here to cycle the lever. It's going to let in more mud and muck. It's actually going to be worse. And then, I can't take this onto a boat. Are you kidding me? The penetration power? I'll pop a hole in my boat. That's, as Sea Cowboy Captain, I cannot allow that to happen to my sweet boat. So, it sucks. Like, the 3030 is a decent round, and I love this one just shooting on range and having fun. Or, you know, if I were out shooting game, this would also be a decent one to have. But in the trenches, on a boat, it's just not the right gun for these scenarios. It wasn't a good one for the war. So, no, this one's actually got to get a hard no. I've got to think about the situation, and it's just not a right fit. So, in a trench, on a boat, she was on the fence, but it's no go. So, that wraps out the 94 and the 92, and I know what you're thinking. Our next episode is probably going to be the something something. It's not. Sorry, guys, but I can't give you all the shotguns in one burst, and I can't give you all the lever actions in one burst. And I know it seems like I gave you all the 32s in one burst, but hey, we were hard up and we didn't have a big Patreon back then. We had a lot of 32s at that time, too. Like, yeah. a lot. We had a very good friend with a lot of 32s. Who was sending us more 32s, so we are not even done yet. The All 32 channel is back! All right, guys, we'll see you later. Bye. All right, guys, you're going to get a proper video update because there's a couple things I need to cover. Number one, I know coming out of this episode that a lot of you are going to say, 
well, Ian over at Forgotten Weapons didn't say this, or you didn't say that, or you guys disagree about X, Y, or Z. And that's true. Uh, we both cited different sources. Uh, there was an early book that gave serial numbers that date from here. There's later research that says those serial numbers actually date a little later. Um, it all comes down to, for me, the fact that I have someone who's telling me that they have first-hand account of a document out of Cody Firearms Museum, one that we are confirming, however, with the release and the confusion, I'm gonna have to check it on the back end. So keep an eye over on social media. I'll make sure to update you guys if we can get a copy of that. But regardless, this is a good time to sort of stop and say that there's a reason why you don't wanna have only one person doing every single task. Because for as much as we might have a little bit better information on the 94 since we put a lot more time into it, at the same time, we have an episode on the Bertier way back when we first started this series and had much more limited resources and time. And Ian over at Forgotten Weapons is smoking us right now on Bertier information. So please go check out his resources because they are very fresh, very new, and history changes all the time as we unearth more documents. For our part, I think episodes one and two for sure need to be redone by the end of the series because they are drastically dated already just in the two years we've been up and running because more people care, more people are invested, and a lot of notes are coming out. So again, stay involved in the show and make sure you support not just Ian and I or you know other your favorite shows of yours, but support anybody that you know of that is doing this kind of research. Go and buy the books. Go and pay attention to the forum. See if you can help out with serial data, any of that sort of thing. It's a community. It's not, you know, uh, a spire. Anyway, with that stuff aside, uh, we do have a current t-shirt campaign. Uh, I'm wearing my US one, and we are doing very well. We're more than 30% over what we were at last year, and we still have, I think, like three weeks to go. So uh, if you would like a CN Arsenal t-shirt, there are four designs currently to select from. There will be more. We release two a year as it stands, unless something changes or improves. So uh, right now, it's France, Germany from last year, and then new this year, Austria, Hungary, and the good old US of Ah. So get over there, and if you'd like one of these to display, please grab one. Um, the details are there. It's a campaign. It's going to be a little while before they ship. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you're impatient and you want a shirt sort of more recently, well, again, talking about our good friends at Forgotten Weapon, don't forget you can support them because somebody sent me a lovely Bertier shirt in the mail, and I frankly like it quite a bit. Now, uh, last up on the docket, I want to make sure that I do not forget to thank patrons because that is why, if you go back and watch early episodes, it's why the show looks so much better now than it did then is because we can leverage the time, assets, and resources thanks to the funds that you guys provide. We appreciate it a lot. Oh, I almost forgot, uh, not just because of the shirt do I have the 1917 out, but our friends over at Iraq Veteran 8888, 888? I always, I never know how many eights. It's a lot of eights. But anyway, our friends over there have a video up about the 1917. Um, it's a little lighter on the history than we go, but it's much, much heavier on the shooting, and they push it out to a much further range than we have available here. So if you guys just want to see some good old 1917 shooting, go check that out. And also, Kevin snuck in a little mention for us. All right, you guys have a good one. We'll see you next time.